look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come thankful this morning that you've given us, blessed us to be able to give back to your kingdom, to this church. Lord, we pray that you bless this offering, use it to your glory, bless all those that had to give, uh, press on our hearts the need to give, show us through your glory and through the growth of your church the reason why we give, and we give you all the honor and praise for your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Good morning. I appreciate you all inviting me back once again, my brother, Pastor Nate, um, for allowing me to preach and for the warm welcomes you all have offered to me and my family this morning. Uh, for our scripture this morning, we'll be looking at the book of Romans, the 10th chapter. And I'll read verses 1 through 14. be reading from the NASB translation for those that follow along on the screens, but if you have your Bibles or phones, it's even better. The book of Romans, the 10th chapter, and I'll begin reading at verse 1. Romans 10:1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him would not be disappointed. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And I'll stop right there. I want to preach this morning from the topic, please believe. Let me pray first. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for setting forth this time for your people to gather into your name, to hear from you. Lord, you have set aside me to preach this word and for all of us to be here together to hear your word. And I pray that I would say only what you would have me to say, that each would hear only what you would have them to hear. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. Amen. Uh, and this, this book of Romans that we're reading, Paul, Apostle Paul is writing to a mixed church of Jews and Gentiles, a church that was suffering from some division. They had some issues, as do all churches, and Paul writes to introduce himself before he comes on a visit. We see that in the first chapter of Romans. But as I think about Romans and what makes it really special to me is what he writes about. He doesn't talk about the specific issues going on in the church. He doesn't call people out on their sins and specific things as we see he does in other letters. Instead, in this book, he just writes about the gospel. He explains the gospel as clear as anyone ever has in my mind. He 
takes the gospel and he unpacks it all throughout this book, all aspects of the gospel and how that affects our life. He talks about sin, he talks about salvation, about predestination, justification, sanctification. He talks about the law. He talks about the spirit. And he applies all of this to all areas of daily living about how we should treat our brothers and sisters, how we should get along with government, how we should treat the weaker ones in the church. He takes the gospel and unpacks it so that we can know how to live as Christians ought. And what I like about that is because I believe we need more of this these days. We're in a divided nation, nation in a contentious world where Christians seem to be struggling to figure out what to say and when to say it and how to do things. And we see churches struggling with the same ideas of, of what to say, whom will I might offend. But I think we need to focus these days more on what it is that we know to be true. And that is the gospel message to focus on what unites us. And that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. So I don't know about y'all, but I've heard enough theories about what's going on. I've heard enough hypotheses, enough opinions, and enough thoughts. What I want is the truth, because the truth never changes, and God never changes. His word never changes. So why get caught up with all the rhetoric of what's going on as opposed to just focusing in on the truth of God's word? And I'll tell you, God's word is something. This verse 14, and it's just one part of this, has been on me for probably three years now. That verse, that part where he says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And every time I hear that verse, it does something to me. It, it makes me grateful that I do know the Lord, that I do believe that I can call on him. There's a song in our church we like to sing called Just a Little Talk with Jesus. Tell him all about my troubles. He'll hear my faintest cry and he'll answer by and by. And the fact that I'm able to call on him is a benefit to knowing him. But I've been a Christian so long, I was saved at eight years old. You've seen me walking out at certain times in my life, you wouldn't always know it, but I've always known Jesus Christ. I've always been able to call on him even when I was out doing wrong. So I've been knowing him so long, I don't remember what it's like to not know him. But there's a burden on my heart because there's a world out there that doesn't know him. Some even go as far as to reject him outright. Many try to find their own solutions, other religions, Substances, many chase power, money, and respect, trying to get along in this world. They try to fill themselves up with the things of this world, not knowing they'll never be satisfied as long as they're separated from their God, their creator, and their savior, Jesus Christ. And it's because of that I feel bad for them. They can't call on him. When they're stressed and overwhelmed, as we all get, who do they turn to? When they make mistakes and they need forgiveness, what do they do? No matter how much you make, you can't buy peace. You can't buy joy. You can't buy hope. All of that's only found in Jesus Christ. He's offering that to us for free. He's offering himself and his salvation and all the other things that come with it for free. So I feel that bad for those that want to go out and try to make their way up in this world, but there are no thought for the next world, the life that is to come. And that's why I titled this message, Please Believe. Because I, I beg some of these people to believe. I wish that that I could force them to believe, but I can't. All I can do is share, to testify, to witness to what I know to be true, to testify to what God has done in my life. Try to explain to them and persuade them that they don't know what they're missing out on. But then there are Christians among us that are missing out on the benefits of this salvation as well. They may know the Lord, they may be saved, but they're not taking advantage of all that comes with him and they don't have that peace and that joy themselves because they're not growing as believers. They're not doing all that God has provided for them. They're not using and living life as they should. And that's why I say, please believe. Please believe to the unbeliever. Believe him and get to know him. But for those of us that know him, live like you know him. Live like you believe. Live with assurance that God is there for you. And I think Paul agrees. As I read through this passage here, this, this part that we're in, Romans 10, begins as part of a section in Romans 9 through 11 where Paul is preaching the same message. And he starts off seeing that Paul is grieved over the state of his people. In chapter 9, verse 2, he says that he has sorrow and grief in his heart. Chapter 9, verse 3, he says he wished that he was cursed to see his people saved. And he's struggling with what I'm struggling with, that many of us struggle with, that you see people that you love live lives that are pointless, chasing things and ideas, chasing this world 
headed in the opposite direction of heaven. And there's not much you can do about it. They ignore God and his word, living below how they should be. And it hurts, puts a burden in our heart to get the gospel out. But I think God honors that. And he wants us to go to him in prayer. He wants us to study his word and, and realize what it is that can save us. And he wants us to appreciate that we know him. But Paul makes it clear, chapter 9, verse 6, he says, It's not as though the word of God has failed. He says the promise still stands for those that choose to believe it. And that's why I'm here to preach this word today. That is good news, that is great news for us, that if we believe the gospel, that is benefits for us, that there's peace, there's faith, and there's hope if we believe the gospel. So if we look at chapter 10, verse 1, we see Paul prays for their salvation. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. We see Paul have the burden that we all have. We should all desire to see people saved. Paul doesn't just complain about them. He doesn't just talk about their sin and what they do. He prays to God that they might be changed. And that's the thing that we should do for all people. We should pray that God would change them, that he will reveal himself to them, that he would convict them, that he would open their heart, that they might receive and see him and receive him into their lives. That's the best thing we can do, and that's the only thing that every one of us can do. We're not all called to be missionaries. We don't know everyone in the world to be able to reach them with a message. But we can pray for people by name. We can pray for people by region. We can pray and give to God's kingdom that he might use the gifts that we give and the people that we know and encourage to go out and save people. That should be a burden on our heart that, God, would you save people? Would you show them? And it's smart to talk to God because he's the one that has the power to save. He's the one that created the world. He's the one that created man. He's the one that called Israel out. He's the one that designed this way of doing things. So it's smarter to talk to him about people than to just talk to people all the time about what others are doing, how others disappoint us about what they're missing out on. Paul, he says it in chapter 9. He says, God can show mercy to whom he shows mercy. He says that he can have compassion on whom he would have compassion. When we recognize the holy God, the powerful God that we serve, we got to go to him in prayer. But the problem comes in verse 2 and 3. He says, For I test about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. See, the truth is there are a lot of people that seem good, that do good, that seem just misguided, but being good won't get you into heaven. You might have good intentions. People want to help. They want to get along, but they're missing the point. But the good thing is if we can point that zeal in the right direction, then they can be an asset to the kingdom of God. There are a lot of people that are passionate. They want to come alongside churches and try to help. They they think we're noble in the causes that we give to. They respect what the church does, but if they don't believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter how much you admire the church or how much you respect our teachings and our works. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ and him crucified, then you have a different faith than I have. You have a different view of life than I have, and we're going to two different places. People, they are passionate about the work of the church, but they won't take the time to get to know God, know his word, know his will, know his ways, and what happens is what they think is right becomes right. Instead of doing what God says is right, they become their own gods. We become our own God determining what's right and wrong. Just know whatever law that we create is going to be one that we can keep. And that's why you see things changing throughout culture down through the years. We're going to create a law that benefits us. And that's how it is with people. They become self-righteous instead of recognizing that Christ is the only one righteous. Verse 4, he says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ alone and this Bible alone determines what's right and wrong. Not us, not society, not even theologians. Only God determines what's right and wrong. It doesn't matter what's legal. It doesn't matter what's acceptable. We go by what God says. And what God says is right and true and just and holy for all times, for all cultures, and for all who believe. See, as a Christian, we recognize that our righteousness comes from Christ alone. We admit, I admit that his life is perfect, not mine. But we try by the power of the Spirit to live like him, but I got to recognize, I'll admit I'm not perfect. You see me on the right day or the right time, and I may not be speaking the way I should. I might not be doing all that I should, but I'm always allowing the Holy Spirit to convict me and correct me 
and uplift me so I can get on the right track so that I can live as God would have me to live so that I can be a witness for him. And that's the difference when self-righteous folk and those of us that are humbled by his grace. We recognize that only him is the standard and no matter how good I am, I'm not living up, I'm not living exactly like Christ. He was sinless. He never messed up. And I know that I've messed up. And though I don't live like I should, I still want to live like Christ. My desire, my hope is to live like him. And that's a benefit that comes with believing is that peace that you have. So when you do mess up, when you do make a mistake, when you do stumble, you know that God has forgiven you already, that he already knew what you would do, that he still chose you before the foundation of the world. And even us people that go out and try our best, he uses us to things far beyond what we're qualified for. And that's the benefit of believing is that peace, but also that humility that comes with knowing I'm just another person, but God can do amazing things through a regular person like me or you. Whereas the problem of not believing is that you're still under the law. You're putting yourself under a microscope. If you are not believing in Jesus Christ, then you're looking at the law, and the law is revealing your sin, but the law has no power to save you. It has no power to change you. When your righteousness comes from your efforts, you'll always end up disappointed. But when your righteousness comes from Jesus Christ, you'll never be disappointed because he's perfect, he's good, and the Bible says he's altogether lovely. So you can either be judged by this world, which has no mercy, which is unrealistic, which is unrelenting, which has changing standards, or you can be judged by God, who is your creator, who understands you and who loved you enough to come and die for you. When God saw us struggling in sin, he sent Jesus Christ to save us, not to condemn us, not to cancel us. He came and did what we couldn't do, and as opposed to mocking us and telling us to try harder, he came to save us. Hebrews tells us that we have a high priest now who can sympathize with our weaknesses, who was tempted as we are, yet without sin. And he laid down his life for us sinners. I think about David. David had been sinned and he'd been caught God gave him an option of what his punishment could be. He said, Lord, I want to be judged by you because I trust he know God was merciful as opposed to being trusted and being sent out to the world. And that's how it is with us. We got to trust that if we focus on God and his standard, his righteousness, his law, living like Christ, if we live like that, we don't have to worry about whatever else is going on in the world. But verse 6 and 7 lets us know that God makes it so easy for us, so easy for us to accept him. So easy for us to believe, he says, but the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Don't say in your heart who will ascend into heaven to bring Christ down or who would descend into the abyss to bring Christ up from the dead. See, God doesn't ask us to do what's impossible. He doesn't ask us to do what's unnecessary. We don't have to get ourselves into heaven. We don't have to go up there and try to find Christ. Christ came down to save sinners when we were yet his enemies. We don't have to raise Christ up from the dead, he says here. The disciples didn't have to go to the tomb and wake Christ up and, and pick him up and carry him out. They came to the tomb, and the tomb was empty. Early that Sunday morning, he rose just as he said, Then the disciples got to witness a miracle by just showing up to the tomb. See, God doesn't ask us to do what he's already done, so we don't have to work for our salvation. He's already worked for it. He's already done. The job is finished. He died himself a sacrifice once and for all. And he's made it so easy to receive. So we can serve him in love, but we don't serve him to be loved. We're fully loved no matter what, as soon as we accept him as our Lord. And as a loving God, he's always close to us. That's what he says in verse 8. He says, but what does it say? The word is near in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we're always preaching. See, this word that he has for us is always close to us. And as we read it and study it and put it in our mind and put it in our hearts, we realize that we can recall it at the right time, that God will put the right word in your mind at the right time. When you need patience or when you, you need peace about something, God knows how to bring a word about you. Or when you get complacent, God knows how to convict you with the word. He uses the, this word and puts it in our hearts and our minds, and he has it close to us. So what he says here, his word is near. It's not mysterious. It's not something that we can't talk about. It's not something that we can't understand. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15 that I'll give to you what received unto me, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. If you can remember that, that's the gospel. That's all you need to tell people. 
and God can work through that. You add in your testimony of how God saved you, and he can work through that as well. It's as simple as that. It's deeper than that as well. We, I believe that as a child, but as I grow and study more and more, I understand more aspects of just how saved, how deep salvation is, just how sinful we are as humanity, just how lost we are as humanity. And that makes me realize and appreciate God even more about how, God, how good he is. And as I said, he makes it so easy for us that he says in verse 9, only thing you have to do is confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's all you have to do is believe in your heart, accept it in your mind, confess it with your mouth. When we say confess, that means agree with it. That means admit it. That means acknowledge it. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, if you're able to say it out loud that Jesus is your Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's no doubt about it. That's as simple as it can be. Everybody can do that. Everybody can believe and everybody can say that he is Lord. Many wonder, how do I know if I'm saved? And I come back to this. Do you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? Do you believe in the resurrection? Do you know what he's done for you? If you believe that, and if you're willing to say and confess that he is your Lord, which means you submit to him, you submit your life to him, you acknowledge him as Lord, then you're saved. And that type of faith that you have will give you assurance. It won't just give you insurance. I heard a deacon say that the other week. A lot of people want insurance. They just want to get to heaven, but they don't have the assurance that comes with knowing Christ. One of my favorite verses, John 10, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. He says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. When you know his word, you can have assurance that no one can snatch us out of his hand. He says early in John 10, he says, no stranger will they follow for we recognize his voice and his alone. And that growing wisdom, that the closer you get to God, you start to recognize things in this world is not right. You'll recognize pretty quick when someone might be sounding like they're right, but something is off. And God gives you that discernment that you can recognize pretty quick when something is right and something is true. So the question is, do you truly believe him? Do you, not do you believe in Jesus, but do you believe Jesus? Do you believe his promises? Do you believe his word? Verse 10, he says, with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So you can't hide what's in your heart. That's why it's up to each one of us to make that decision when we have to stand before Jesus. We have to stand before our God. He'll know our heart. You can confess and say stuff to me. You can have your spouse or your coworkers thinking you're saved. Your actions might look like you're saved, but if you don't truly believe in your heart, that's going to be revealed on the last day. Your confession won't help you then, but your confession must follow your belief. There are no covert Christians. You can't be hiding Christians. If, if you believe in him, you need to speak up and say that you believe in him. You have to be water baptized if you can, if you don't leave right before after you believe. But you need to be able to make a statement and say that I believe in Jesus and you're willing to make an action to show that to the public as opposed to hiding. And if you're willing to do that, Scripture says, verse 11, whoever believes in him would not be disappointed. Can anybody testify that if you believe in Jesus, you're not disappointed? I done tried him. I done walked with him through all different types of things and all different situations, and I've never been disappointed by him. I've been disappointed by almost everyone else. I've been disappointed in myself. I've been disappointed in my job, family, friends, but I've never been disappointed in Jesus. I've never been disappointed in the time that I spend with him. I've never been disappointed in the service that I give for him. I've never felt a loss of money I've gave to his cause. There are so many wasted times and opportunities throughout my life, but I've never regretted any effort that I've made for the Lord. So I'll tell you and try to persuade you that if you follow this Lord that I'm talking about, you'll never be disappointed. You'll be great. You'll be fine. You'll be smiling. You'll be full of joy. You'll be full of life, recognizing that God can take the most feeble of efforts and multiply them far beyond what you can imagine. But also I like verse 12 and 13. It says, for there's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for it's the same Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
I hope y'all recognize that pattern. He says, whoever believes in him would not be disappointed. He says here, he's the same Lord of all. Whoever. He makes it clear that anybody can come to him. There's no special stipulations. You don't have to come from a certain place or a certain background in order to be saved by Jesus. We all serve the same Lord. We all have the same opportunity. Your past might be different than my past, but if you sin one time, it's like you've sinned a thousand times. So we all come to him as sinners needing grace. And he has enough grace for all of us. He has enough to satisfy all of us. He has enough riches to satisfy all of us and provide for all of our needs. So with so many benefits to believing in Jesus, the question comes, why don't more call on him? And that's the, that's the thing that bothers me, that kind of boggles my mind. Even when I look back on other periods of my life, like why didn't I call home, on him more? Why did I go into that situation without prayer? Why did I go around those things without thinking of the impact of my witness and my testimony on my church? Why did I spend time not in church? Why did I spend time not in Bible study? Why don't we call on him more? It's like we got this membership, but we're not taking advantage of all the benefits. We was looking at gyms, and there's one called Lifetime in Centerville, and not only can you go to the treadmill, but you can play basketball, and you can get in the pool, and you can do all these other things, and you've got this membership. You ought to take advantage of all the benefits, but it takes one to educate you of all the things that come with that membership, and that's our job as to Christians, to help other struggling Christians and let them know all the things that come with knowing Christ. Yes, it's about salvation at the end. Yes, it's about getting to heaven, but he can make life here beautiful. He can save marriages and he can help kids and he can heal you when you're sick and he can provide when you're in need and he can make your enemies end up loving you and having to respect you and he can change your heart and give you patience and he can make you worthy. He can lift you up in front of other people. There are all these benefits that come with knowing him. But yet there's so many of us that live out there saved but not living like it, still scared, still struggling, still shallow. God has given us this great gift of eternal life. He's given us books like Romans to explain all that comes with that, yet we ignore it. And we just go by, barely getting by, day by day, as opposed to living the life that God would have us to live and being fruitful. Because at the end of the day, when you're a mature and Christian, you want to be fruitful. You want to see God work through you and expand his kingdom through your word and through your witness. And he's made it so simple for us to believe. He, he tells us that in verse 14, how then will they hear, call on him they've not believed? How then will they believe in him they've not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Verse 15, he says, and how will they preach unless they are sent? One of the paraphrases of those verses says, before people can ask the Lord for help, they must believe in him. But before they can believe in him, they must hear about him. Before them to hear about him, someone must tell them. Before someone can tell them, that person must be sent. Yeah, I'm up here teaching this morning, but all of us are sent. All of us are disciples, called and commissioned by him to go out and make disciples. So you might not stand up in front of a church, but there's someone that you can preach the good news to. There's someone that you can witness to. And you know those people in your family, on your job, or that you encounter. You know those people that are saved, that are not saved, or they're not living like they're saved. It's, it should be a burden on your heart to go out and reach them with this message and tell them how simple it is to follow. Jesus Christ. God is doing the calling. He's doing the sending. The question is, what are we doing? Are we available for him? And I'll just say in times like this, we should have an urgency. Because the more I look around, people need help. People are lost. There's mental health cases. There are people taking their lives by suicide. There are so many that are living in good lives and good situations, but they're so corrupted in the mind. They're so confused as to what's really going on in this world that they don't find peace. I feel bad for them that they don't know Jesus, so they can't call on Jesus. People panic when they could have peace. People lose it when they can have calmness. People flex their power as opposed to being meek. They like to cause chaos as opposed to being peacemakers. And I just wish that we would all go out with this message so that we see the world change, that there are more peacemakers. There are more meek. There are more that are pure in heart so that we can see God's kingdom flourish here. But if not, we know he's coming back one day, and it might be today. He, he's coming back one day soon to make all things right. But until then, our sole focus should be on getting this gospel out. We look at people on TV, personalities, generals, 
politicians and we see all that they can do, but we don't have the same access to them. As Christians, we don't call on them to fix our problems. We call on the true and living God. And he works through all those others. And the true and living God hears us immediately. He knows us personally. And he has all the resources necessary to fix not just my problems, but yours. Because God will fight our battles. God will guide us through turbulent times. And the Bible says he will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. Most of the time, the problem that we see is deeper than this world can fix. Because the root of the problem is always sin. And the world offers no solution for that. Science tries to reason it away. The government tries to legalize sin away. But it doesn't matter what someone says is okay. Because the Bible says the law is written on our hearts and our conscience testifies and our thoughts accuse us or they defend us. God has given us the ability to know right from wrong. And if you're a believer, he's given you his spirit to convict you and correct you. And it's in those quiet moments when it's just us and God that he speaks to us and he warns us of impending things and he warns us of things we need to change and he reminds us of things that we've done. But he also encourages us that he's going to be with us to the end of the age. He also uses these Bible stories and testimonies to encourage us that if we're going through, that he'll be with us to see us through. And if you call on him, you'll never be disappointed. So it might be some tough times ahead. We might spend some nights wrestling with our thoughts, but I can testify if you give yourself to God, if you trust in his word, if you believe in his word and believe him, you will not be disappointed. <clears throat> so I say, please believe. I extend an invitation to all those here now. Please believe. If there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I ask you to believe him now. Don't wait till you get home. Don't say, I need to think about it more. Come to one of us, preachers, elders, anyone in here, and we'd like to explain more to you about Jesus Christ so that you can get this decision right today. I don't want you to leave here without that settledness, that assurance that I'm talking about. I'm not naturally a confident person, not naturally a bold person, but through Christ I have confidence. I have a boldness that I can stand and talk about heaven and hell, knowing that God himself is working through his words, and I'm just repeating what he said, what he's given the message and put on my heart. So I say to you, each one of you here, you're already saved, good. I want you to go out and tell somebody this week, somebody that doesn't know him about Jesus Christ. Tell them about the message you've heard. If it's not the message, just read this part of Romans to them. Just explain to them who Christ is, and let's see what God can do this week. So I extend the invitation to you all. If there might be one, you can come forward now. There is none. I ask you all to stand as we look to be dismissed. We also want to open it up with a time of prayer. If there is someone that wants to come forward and have prayer by someone, one of the elders, we'll be down here at the front. We'd love to pray with you, pray about whatever your situation is, help you to feel somebody in the corner with you, feel somebody walking through your situation with you. So we have those coming to the front. If there's one that wants to come and receive prayer, it'd be our pleasure to pray with you and pray for you. There might be one that wants to come for that, for prayer. Right, let us look to be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, at the end of this service. Lord, praying your blessing over all that's been said and done. Praying your blessing over each one that is here today, for all the homes represented, for each one that's taking the time to come to hear from you. Lord, I pray that you work through your word, work through the message that has been given, work through the encouragement of those other saints that have taken their time to come, Work through the smiles and the encouragement and all those that have taken time to set this building up, to prepare the music, to prepare the lights, the audio. Lord, bless their time, bless their efforts. Lord, allow us to see you more clearly because of our time here today. Allow us to feel your peace, feel your love. Allow us to feel that joy that comes from salvation. 
Allow us to feel that hope to get us through these times by knowing that you are with us. And that when our time ends on this earth, that we'll get to see you face to face. And we'll get to celebrate. We'll get to rejoice. Not because we were so perfect. Not because we earned our way into heaven, but that you loved us enough to save us, to call us, to choose us, and to make sure that we made it home. For Lord, we are your sheep, the sheep of your pasture. Bless this church. Bless all those that are here. Bless the pastor, my brother Nate. As he is out on vacation, Lord, give him safe travels and enjoy his time. Bless those that need prayers, Lord. There are unspoken requests I know on each one of our hearts. If it's not for a personal situation, it's for someone. Put someone in each one's mind, Lord, that needs to know you and work through us so that we can see you working, so that we can give credit to no one but you, so that we can see your glory, so that we can see your goodness working through us and into the lives of others. Lord, heal our nation. Be with those that are in charge, not just in the community, but throughout the world, so that your word might go forth, so that it might be okay for us Christians to continue to proclaim that it's you that we believe in. For those that are under persecution, Lord, give them the boldness to continue to speak your name. For we want to see what's happening in heaven here on earth. Lord, bless us. May your will be done. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.